you all for coming. I'm Summer. I'm the curator here at the museum. Before we get started, everybody please take a second to turn off and oh, turn off or silence your cell phones so we don't have any disruptions. Um, as for announcements, our cottages and courtyards tour will be on Saturday, April 2nd from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Tickets are now on sale. Um, there's information about the tour at that back table if you're interested. It also includes information about the after party called the Spirit of Spring at the Addison. Also, our annual golf tournament is scheduled for April 8th. Information cards with team registration forms are also at the back table. As for upcoming programs, um, we will be having our next temporary exhibit opening next Friday on March 25th. This is the annual student-led exhibit curated by a group of local high school students. And this year's exhibit is entitled Nassau County's African American Schools and discusses three of our area's black schools during the segregation period. The exhibit opening will feature a panel of alumni from the schools to talk about their experiences. Our April brown bag lunch on April 6th will be with our education director, Thea Seagraves who will share the legacies, stories, and legends of African Americans in Northeast Florida. And then for our April 3rd on 3rd, on April 15th, we will have Steve Knowles, who will discuss the history of human interaction with water in Florida. Dr. Knoll is the lead scholar for the Waterways Smithsonian Exhibit, which will be exhibited at the museum this May through a grant funded by the Florida Community. Also, if you have an evaluation sheet at your seat, um, please fill it out after the program and return it to the basket at the back table. Um, so that's it for announcements, but tonight we have Michael Ray Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald is a musician, media scholar, and former university instructor from Jacksonville. He is the author of four books, including the award-winning Jacksonville and the Roots of Southern Rock, as well as Swamp Music, both of which examine the music and culture of North Florida. He holds a master's degree in media history from the University of Florida and a doctoral degree in film and television from the University of Reading. Reading. Uh, Thank you so much. I'm really pleased y'all could make it out tonight. <coughs> I'm going to talk about Southern Rock and what it means. Well, what does it mean? I, I wrestled with that quite a bit when I was writing this book. What is Southern Rock? So I couldn't come up with a definition that helped it out. Anybody want to offer one? <laughs> you know, at first I assumed it was a combination of rock, blues, gospel, and uh, country. But then, you know, most of the music from the early 70s had those elements in it, like the Doobie Brothers, and even before that, Creedence Clearwater. So, and they weren't from the South. Uh, it, there's so many groups that were doing, and the Rolling Stones would be a Southern Rock band by that definition. So, I don't know. I, I you know, I wrote a book about it, and I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> My final conclusion that the term was pretty meaningless, but we all know it when we hear it, right? One guy told me, well, Southern Rock has to have, who is it? He says, Southern Rock has to have the twin guitars. Well, if that's the case, I would include the Eagles. <laughs> and Rolling Stones. And the Beatles did it on And Your Bird Can Sing. So, you know, the, trying to find a, a, a meaning for this term it is pretty fruitless endeavor. So, uh, this is like my fourth book. Uh, my next one I'm writing is, the one I'm working on now is uh, Guitar Heroes of Jacksonville. And that's a lot more fun. A lot of famous uh, guitarists came through Jacksonville. Uh, so, uh, I want to talk about the forerunners of Southern Rock. You know, the people who were <coughs> insp inspirational to the Southern Rockers uh, in Jacksonville. Obviously, the first one is Ray Charles. He's a... Uh, He's a Georgia native. He was born in Albany in the 19, early 1930s. His family moved to Greenville, uh, Florida, which is right outside of Madison, when he was a little kid. And uh, when he started, he started going blind as a child. I don't think anybody's really sure why, but his mother sent him to the deaf and blind school in St. Augustine, where he did not graduate. He quit when he was 16. And he moved up to Jacksonville, and which was, 
you know, a very happening place, especially the neighborhood called La Villa, which had, a, you know, a lot of African-American nightclubs. It's called the Harlem of the South. He really didn't do too well there. He was sort of starving and everything. Y'all remember this song, right? So that's kind of a combination of blues, the 12 bar blues with three chords. It's got a Latin beat, and then it's got these gospel elements where the choir is answering him. So it's a, he was a, a genre breaker, you know. Our musical styles didn't matter to him. He would throw anything together that worked to his ear. He had a really famous uh, country music phase in 1962. Anybody remember that? I Can't Stop Loving You mm -hmm. and uh, Crying Time. Man, I love those records. So this is why I say he's the forerunner of Southern Rock because he mixed all these <coughs> Southern styles together. And he was from the South. May Axton who was from Texas, she moved to Jacksonville during World War II with her husband, who was a Navy pilot. Her son was Hoyt Axton. She had two sons. One of them was Hoyt Axton, who went on to write the, the book, the one about the frog. <laughs> and uh, he wrote a, a couple of pretty big songs. He wrote The Pusher Man, and he wrote um, uh, The Greenback, Greenback Doll, that changed the trio. But his mom, was the one who, who was really the songwriter. She wrote about a hundred songs, including uh, co-writing Heartbreak Hotel. And she happened to know, before she wrote that, in well, you know, she may not have actually written Does anybody here know Marshall Rowland? He, he lives here in front of me. He was a radio station owner. He owned WQIK when it first started out. And he worked with May Axton, and they were promoters, and they would bring Axe the town, and she brought Elvis to town with um, Hank Snow at the ball field in 54, I guess it was. And uh, so she already knew Elvis, so she had a shot. She knew he was getting ready to get signed to RCA because she knew Colonel Parker. In fact, that's who she was actually working for. And so she had the inside information, she, so she decided she was going to write uh, with uh, Tommy Durden, who was a steel player on the... Uh, Toby Dowdy show, I think it was called uh, McDuff Hayride. No, it was called Country Frolics. And so she and Toby got together and they wrote Heartbreak Hotel, but I, I'm not sure she actually wrote it. Uh, Marshall Rowland told me Tommy Durden had already written it before he even met her. <laughs> but she put her name on it. <laughs> and she put Elvis's name on it, and we know he didn't write it. <laughs> so here's a little taste of that. Again, it's just a three chord blues. That's all it is. I mean, this is pure blues, really. It could be a Jimmy Reed song. But he was considered a country act at first because he was on a radio station called uh, a radio show called Louisiana A Ride out of Shreveport. So <clears throat> she contributed Heartbreak Hotel. And again, you know, they're mixing up country and rock. Well, yeah, rock and um, blues. They're mixing all these things up together. And uh, this record went to number one in 56 for Elvis. It was his first name seller. Johnny Tillotson is actually from Jacksonville. And you, I believe he went, he, he went to high school in Palaka because he went to live with his grandmother when she was not, you know, pretty, pretty uh, elderly. <clears throat> so he went to high school in Palatka, but he's from Jacksonville, from the north side. He uh, was also on Toby Dowdy's TV show with Tom Dirt, and uh, he got his own show called The Velvet Show in Jacksonville. Somebody brought one of his records to uh, a, a talent show without consulting him, brought one of his demos to a talent show in Nashville, and he got on, and he didn't win. But he got signed to uh, Cadence Records by Archie Blyer. Archie Blyer was the uh, talent coordinator for uh, Arthur Godfrey's uh, talent scouts. So he got a deal, and he, he didn't get the prize, but he got a record deal. And uh, I don't remember the name of his first record. Oh, yeah. I don't remember the name of his first record, but he wrote it himself. 
It was a country song. He was sort of a semi-country pop crooner. He uh, played guitar like Elvis, and then he gave up the guitar like Elvis. And um, his big hit was Poetry in Motion in 1960. Michael, that's what happens when you accidentally press the button right beneath the... Okay. Yeah. I cry myself to sleep each night Wishing I could hold you That's kind of what they call it. Life seems so, so empty, like say you do it away. Kind of like a real polished type of country day. The pillow it's kept with the strings on it. You lay your head. Now hold my lonely tears it's in the sky. The kind of middle class country. And it keeps right on. Right on. <laughs> Sometimes it feels so like the middle class country. So you can see he's here with uh, Ray Charles. They both moved to Los Angeles and they, they got to be buddies. And they both had lived in Jacksonville. Oh, I already talked about Hoyt. Uh, that's his mom, May, when she was living in Nashville. Hoyt, I'll tell you a funny story about Hoyt actually. When, when he, on graduation night from Lee High School, he was drunk. And he came across a burning schmuck smudge pot. I don't know if anybody remembers those. It was a, a little, what, oil, kerosene, or burning torch that they keep in the road instead of the yellow blinker. He picked one up and threw it through the glass window of Canales Hardware Store in Canal Street <laughs> and burned it all the way to the ground. Oh, and the police arrested him, and he got charged with arson, but guess what? That's not the correct charge. That ain't arson. That's just, you know, vandalism. Arson's when you do it for money. So he got off scot-free, but the canower, but the, canower <laughs> the canower family sued him, and so he couldn't play in Florida without the sheriff coming to his gigs and seeing him. <laughs> you remember this one? Yes. Yeah. Huge hit for... Uh, Three dog night. Three dog Here's a group from Jacksonville before the Southern Rock boom, but there's a couple of Southern Rock guys in there. Well, actually, they're all in on to be Southern Rock guys. Scott Boyer was later in a group called Cowboy. David Brown was also in Cowboy, and he played with Boss Skaggs and moved to San Francisco. Uh, and uh, he also played with Greg Allman. And Butch Trucks, y'all know who he is, right? Yeah. <laughs> He's a, he became the drummer for the Allman Brothers band. Yeah. Uh, but at this time, they were really big on folk rock, and they were birds clones. Everything they did sounded like the birds. That's a Bob Dylan song. But it's all over now. That's not looking like the birds as well. They were managed by a local guy in Jacksonville named Don and Dana, and, and, and they got a, 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 a deal with Vanguard Records. It wasn't a major thing, but it was close. Meanwhile, in Daytona Beach, you have uh, Dwayne and Greg Allman, and this is their group, The Escorts. And believe it or not, when they first started out, Dwayne was the singer. That's why he's center stage, and Greg plays the guitar. Can you, can you believe that? And uh, that was a group called the Escorts. They changed their name later to the Honor Joys. <laughs> this is one of uh, maybe their first record on Dallas. What year was this? 67. Good year. <laughs> they had, by the time the Honor Brothers came on that record, they were the fourth record. The Classics Four was a, not a Southern Rock group. They were very kind of like a jazzy, easy listening group, really. But they were from Jacksonville. Um, Dennis Yost was the drummer. Walter Eaton, who was a friend of mine, was the guitar player, but he switched to bass. J.R. Cobb turned out to be a real famous uh, session player in Atlanta, and he went on to form the Atlanta Rhythm Section, which wow. most people consider a Southern Rock band. And Joe Wilson was a Andrew Jackson High School friend of Walter's. But th th these three all played guitar. But when they formed this group, Wally went to bass and Joe Wilson went to the organ. And Dennis was a drummer, 
And they didn't even know he was singing, but when he started singing, he would stand up while he played the drums. <laughs> so you can see him singing. Everybody remember this one. It's not Southern Rock. Here, yeah, here they are uh, at a teen club in Jacksonville. I'm not sure which one. I think it might be Woodstock Youth Center. You see Dennis standing up while he's playing. And there's Cobb in the Atlanta rhythm section, along with Robert Nix. Both of these guys graduated from Paxson High School in 1962. And actually, Robert Nix was the second drummer in the classics. So these guys went way back and continued way forward in their careers. Um, OK, I'm going to talk about Graham Parsons. Has anybody heard of him? Yeah. He's considered like the father of country rock. Not, I, I, there were other people doing it before him. Um, the Birds were doing it, which he later joined the Birds. And a guy from Waycross who had moved to Los Angeles, moved to San Diego, named um, uh, Larry Murray. He was also from Waycross. Grand grew up in Waycross, which is not far from here, is it? No. 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 What, about 50 miles? 40, 50 miles? And um, here's a picture of him from the uh, Bowles. High school yearbook. You, you never know how he was going to turn out <laughs> from looking at this. <laughs> to be honest with you, one of the uh, admins at Bowles didn't want to talk about Grand Parsons because <laughs> of his notorious association with heroin. And, and, he was, and that's how he died. He overdosed on morphine. So they, at Bowles, they don't even really want to talk about it. <laughs> but, uh, there were, why, you know, why do I have him in a presentation on Southern Rock? Well, to me, and I studied this for a long time, West Coast Country Rock and Southern Rock are, to me, are two sides of the same coin. They're really so similar. You can't, you almost can't even divorce the two. Maybe Southern Rock was a little rougher, a little tougher. And there he is in his nudie, his nudie suit. <laughs> um, you can see the pot leaves on it. <laughs> Let me see if I got anything about him. There's a rumor that he co wrote Wild Horse with Pete But for some reason, Stone didn't get his credit, if the rumor's true. It's a big, big controversy on the Grand Parsons Facebook. Did he or didn't he write? I personally think he did because he sings it so much better than Jack. He sings it, did you ever hear that? He sounds like he owns it, whereas Jagger sounds like he's reading it. Now, here we're getting into the second coming, although it still wasn't Southern Rock. The phrase Southern Rock didn't even come into usage until after the Allen Brothers Dallas ones. Dickie Betts was a guitar player from Bradenton who used to come to Jacksonville a lot to work because there were a lot of clubs and a lot of places to make money. So he came up here and did that. And he uh, was with a group called the Second, uh, they were called the Blues Messengers with um, Barry Oakley on the bass player. Barry talked him into, let's play psychedelic music, man, for the hippies. <laughs> and and, and, and uh, Dickie didn't want to do it. He wanted to keep playing the bar band music because it was guaranteed income. And the psychedelic music was a big gamble. And they couldn't, and they got a gig at a nightclub in, uh, Leonard Rensler, who owned the scene, and he owned the R&R &R bar, and he owned the, the, the Golden Gate Lounge, he had partners in a bunch of bars, was down in Tampa and heard them as the Blues Messengers, and he offered him a house band at this new club called The Scene that has psychedelic lights everywhere. So he figured, these guys were psychedelic, it fit the theme <laughs> of the club, it's the new thing, you know, we're going to make a killing. But he insisted that they change their name, Rensler, the bar owner, insisted that they change their name to... The second coming, and the rumor is because he thought Barry Oakley looked like Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I am not making this up. <laughs> this is Dickie singing a cream number. I feel free. I have this record. And there he is, Eric Bessner, Clapton. Uh, he, he was a big Eric Clapton fan, and Eric Clapton had a, a red 335 like this one also. Uh, so, you know, Dickie Betts was in on the ground floor of Southern Rock because he helped.
helped create the Armand Brothers band. I was at Woodstock Youth Center one night to go hear the second coming, and there was this long-haired, skinny, stringy-looking guy with his head down, hogging all the solos. And my friend and I were, were yelling, we were heckling, and we were saying, let Dickie play. We, we paid money to hear Dickie. Who is this guy? It was Dwayne Elman. <laughs> <laughs> we were heckling Dwayne Elman. <laughs> this was a spring of 1969. Elman came down. And st well, actually, Elman lived in Jacksonville first. Dwayne Elman lived in Jacksonville for quite some time. And he, I think he was trying to get into the second comic. But it, it didn't work, and so he got this crazy idea he was going to move to Muscle Shoals and become a session player. <laughs> and it worked. Not only did he become a session player, but he got famous from uh, his solo on a Wilson Pickett record. Jerry Wexler at Atlantic wanted to sign him to a record deal and put a band together around him. So he got way more than he bargained for. <laughs> and he was living in Jacksonville, and he just got a wild hair and said, I'm moving to Muscle Shoals. He, he had done some recording in Muscle Shoals with his previous band. This is a group from Jacks, uh, from also from Tampa, uh, featuring Larry Reinhardt. Larry had played with Dickey in a group called the Thunder Beats, which was uh, led by Matt Doss. And Matt lived here in Argentina for many, many years. Anybody remember Matt Doss? Oh, oh well. And so uh, in, he was in the Second Coming with Dickey Betts. They had two guitar players. Betts did the Clapton tunes. And Reinhardt did the Hendrix tune. <laughs> and uh, so he, he split up and formed his own group called The Low. This is not The Low. This is Dwayne Allman and Barry Oakley of uh, the Allman Brothers band. But he was part of that scene, and they had the same manager, and they used to do shows together, The Low to the Second Coming. And then the, for the third section of the show, they would have a big jam session with both bands and uh, whoever else showed up. Okay, so now we're going to get into actual Southern rock, whatever that means. Starting in 1969 with the formation of the Allman Brothers Band. Actually, you have to go back a step to the Hourglass, which was the Allman Joys. And they added a couple of new members, Paul Hornsby and Johnny Sandlin from Alabama. And they were playing in St. Louis, and they got discovered by Nitty Gritty Dirt Band's manager. And he brought them out to L.A. and got them a deal with Liberty Records. But uh, it didn't go anywhere. So they were very unhappy. They went to uh, Muscle, this group, the Hourglass, went to Muscle Shoals and did uh, some demos there. One of the demos that they did was actually, um, it, ain't my, it Ain't My Cross to Bear. So you could say, you could say Southern Rock started in Los Angeles, because that's where they were <laughs> when they did that. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, I. So Delaney Bramlett was doing a kind of Southern rock in Los Angeles in 67 as well. Um, so, th so this group broke up, and Dwayne moved to Jacksonville and formed the Allman Brothers Band. And here's, uh, Barry, uh, he, here's Barry Oakley, who was in uh, the second coming with Dickie Betts. And here's... Uh, that's Butch Trucks, who's from Jacksonville. He was in the bitter end, as you might remember from a few minutes ago. And uh, the dr another drummer, they had two drummers, was J-Mo. Johnny Johnson was his real name from Mississippi. He had played with uh, Percy Sledge. So this is considered officially the formation of Southern Rock. That's the, that's the narrative, anyway. This is very Southern sound. This, this sounded a lot like country music. And then of course the guitar song is something that has a key on it. I don't remember if I've got a guitar song. I don't guess I do. It's actually Dick Beck's playing this solo. It sounds just like a pedal studio. But it's Dickie on that red third spot. So I yeah, you could say this was uh, country rock. Really. So this is why I say country rock and southern rock are two sides of the same coin. And uh, this is another group of uh, from Jacksonville. Around the same time, uh, 
you know, I can't really make these guys out. I think that uh, Scott Boyer from The Bitter End, he was in The Bitter End with David Brown and with Butch Trucks. And Dwayne Allman got them a deal with Capricorn Records. Right? They were the second group signed to Capricorn. And here they are in a later incarnation. And there's, there's David Brown from The Bitter End. And there's uh, David and Scott, both from The Bitter End. And this is Tommy Talton from uh, Orlando. Mm -hmm. And they were the second group on um, Capricorn, and their records didn't, I don't think they even sold uh, 5,000 records. <laughs> but you might remember this song, Eric Clapton did it. Please be with me. And the slide on this. And I mean, this is LA country rock, wouldn't you say? This doesn't sound like so good. It sounds like Eagles. Yeah, sounds like Eagles and that sort of thing. Okay, here's a new chapter here. Um, the 1%. This was a group from the West Side. They were just youngsters when all the brothers were being formed. Um, I saw them one night at the Forest Inn, which was not too far from my house. <coughs> uh, it's over off um, Lakeshore Boulevard in Jacksonville on Radio Row where WQIK used to be. And they were playing one night, and uh, boy, they were a terrible band. <laughs> <laughs> one of my sources, Richard Price, who was in the load with Larry Linehart, said that they opened for him. Is for the love, and he said they were the worst band he ever heard in his life. <laughs> and um, so they were playing at the Forest Inn, and I remember Ronnie Van Zandt, that's him here. Look, nice of him to get all dressed up. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's wearing a Dickie Betts. Remember, Dickie Betts was wearing a floofy shirt. I guess that was the thing back then. Hendrix did that, you know. And um, Ronnie said, I ain't having none of this. And so, um, he, he, he uh, didn't like the name 1% because people used to call him 1% talent. <laughs> <laughs> so one night I was up there, a Friday night in March of 69, and I was at the Forest Inn, and Ronnie goes, hey, y'all, hey, y'all, uh, we're thinking about uh, we're thinking about changing the name of the group to, uh, what do y'all think about Leonard Skinner? <laughs> I heard him say this, and there was a bunch of Lehigh students in there, and, and, and they were just hooting and hollering, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. And I said to this hippie next to me, I said, who's Leonard Skinner? And he got, the guy says, oh, he's the PE coach who hassles them about their hair. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, true story. So as you know, they got to be a much, they worked real hard, and they got to be a much better band. Mm -hmm. This, this is the original version of Freebird, done in 1969 at Norm Vincent's studio in Jackson. And this came out on 45 on the MC. And there's no guitar solo on it. It's only four minutes long. And that was uh, in the end by Tom Markham. To uh, work at and Jonathan Jones had to work in the studio. They saw him at the uh, Club and signed him up to the But it didn't go nowhere <laughs> at that point. This is the carport where the group was originally formed. This was on Park Street. <laughs> Park. Did they even have a garage? No, they're not even a garage band, they're a carport <laughs> They don't even qualify as a garage band. <laughs> and this is where Ger Gary Rossington and Bob Burns would jam out front. And uh, Larry Johnstrom was with them, too. He lived right around the corner, about two blocks from this house. This is right in my neighborhood where I currently live. And I go by this house all the time on my way to Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, Bob Burns, uh, it was Bob Burns, Gary Rossman, and Larry Johnson, and they were called Me, You, and Him. <laughs> and then Ronnie Van Zandt was in a different group at the time. He was in a group called Us, 
<laughs> with, a, with a friend of mine called uh, Rick, Dur a friend of mine, Rick Dershler. He was the lead singer for us. And that group, I'm not making it up. <laughs> and that group broke up, and Ronnie just came over to the house, and he goes, and Bob Burns, and I, I think I can remember this verbatim. Ronnie came over to the Burns house one morning before school, and he said to Bob, he said, Bob said, answers the door, and he goes, there's Ronnie Van Zandt. And he goes, oh my God, it's the neighborhood tough guy. <laughs> and Bob says, Ronnie, I don't want to fight you. <laughs> and Ronnie said, oh, I ain't here to fight. He says, I'm a singer, man. And Bert goes, oh, you're a singer. And he says, yeah. And Bert says, well, I'll be dang. <laughs> he says, I, I, I heard you guys are starting a group. I want to be your singer. So he became their singer. And, <laughs> and, he, and he, he basically you know, took over the group and, and led it. And, and he delivered on all his promises, too. This is Skinner in 1976 at their height of their fame, in the height of their success, just before their plane crash. And this is from an album that was released three days before the plane crash. And um, this is Gary. Bob is not with him. Artemis Pop from South Carolina took his place. That's Steve James from Oklahoma. There's Alan Collins from the West Side and Leon Wilkinson from Cedar Hill. And, um, you know, uh, what can you say about the plane crash? The, the less, the better, I suppose. Uh, here's another group from Jacksonville from the West Side, Taxin Guys. Rick Medlock and Greg Walker uh, were both in Leonard Skip. Okay, and both replaced uh, the bass player and drummer in Leonard Skinner. And uh, Skinner's uh, early, early uh, album that was released as Skinner's first and last, Ricky Medlock sang a couple songs. This group sounded a lot like Skinner. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> and, and when uh, Skinner had the, the plane crash, you know, there was sort of several local bands vying for that market position. I know it sounds crude, but you know that's business. That the Skinner left a hole in the market, so this is one of the groups that was vying for it. And just the fact that they had been in Skinner and were from Jacksonville gave them a leg up on the competition. This is the cover of a Spirit song, and that's Richard Medlock singing. And he had been on the Tony Dowdy show with his father, um, Shorty Medlock. I mean, it's amazing all the bands from Jacksonville that made it big. Uh, 38 Special, another band that made it terrific. This is the, one of the band that had the most hits. They didn't sell the most records, but they had 15 top 40 singles. And this is Ronnie Van Zandt's younger brother, Donnie. And this is Larry Johnston, who was in Me, You, and Him with Gary and Bob. And Jeff Carlisi from Cedar Hills. Uh, Jack Garner's from New Jersey. Don Barnes from Cedar Hills. And Steve Brookins on drums uh, from uh, the West Side. So this is another bunch of West Siders. But they uh, started getting big when Southern Rock became passe. So they tried to get away. When Don sang, he sounded just like his brother Ronnie. But then all the hits were sung by Don Barnes. You've heard them, uh, Caught Up in You and uh, Hold On Loosely and uh, Fantasy Girl and all those. Those were all sung by Don Barnes because they were trying to get away from the Southern Rock thing because it was an albatross mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. well, it's Don Barnes singing this. And Jeff Carlisi got this guitar riff. He got the idea to cover it on the car. Because you know that stuff 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 uh, here's this is an interesting group, Molly Hatchet. Pat Armstrong was their manager of management, Pat Armstrong Associates. 
He had managed Lennon Skinner very early on. He's the one who sent him up to Macon to uh, hook up with uh, their manager, Alan Walden. So uh, he missed out. Pat, Pat told me that Alan Walden, when, when uh, Skinner got signed, Alan Walden came in his office and put the gun to his head, literally. He oh. said, you're fired. Pat, you're shit. <laughs> So anyway, he missed out on Skinner, but uh, 38 recommended Molly Hatchet to him, and these guys were unbelievably huge. They had four platinum albums, and at first they sounded a lot like Rhythm Skinner. I wonder if that's a coincidence, because they got big right after Skinner's plane crash, so they just kind of slotted right in there and just took up all the Winter Skinner fans you know, who wanted to hear this type of music. In fact, they even did a Skinner medley in their live show. Even before the plane crash, they were doing a Skinner uh, tribute to Skinner in their, in their gigs. Um, I, I knew all these guys. In fact, my sister dated uh, <laughs> Steve Rowland, so he was almost my brother-in-law. <laughs> Danny Joe Brown is a singer. He's from, I think, the Arlington area. Um, Dave Lubeck was the founder of the group. He had gone to Lakeshore Junior High with all the Skinner boys, with all of them. So he knew them. Um, Dwayne Rowan on guitar, uh, uh, Crump on, uh, what's his first name? Bruce Crump on drums, Ben Thomas on bass. Um, there's a story in Larry Steele's book about when, Dwayne, uh, when uh, Dave Lubeck moved to Jacksonville. He's actually born in Jacksonville, but his father's in the Navy when he grew up on the West Coast. And when he moved to Jacksonville when he was uh, 15, he told everybody at the school that he had been in the doors. <laughs> <laughs> it's in Larry Steele's book. Larry just couldn't believe it. Oh, let me play a little bit of Molly Hatchet for you. Apparently, I don't have any. Well, that's a good yeah. thing. Oh, All right. Oh, boy. <laughs> that was real smart. Okay. Wait. Don't touch anything. <laughs> that doesn't look for him. Oh, there we go. Thank you so much. Okay, I gotta be more careful with this. I don't have any music for them. And Johnny Van Zant, uh, I guess you could probably uh, guess he's Ronnie's younger brother, the third Van Zant sibling. Oh my God! I knew their I knew their parents, Lacey and, and sister Mary and Van Zandt. I knew them pretty well. And Lacey Van Zandt told me he was writing a book called Papa V. That's him, Lacey. Papa V. Star Maker times three. <laughs> <laughs> he was uh, quite a character. This guy, Eric Lundgren, uh, is a was a guitar player for Johnny Van Zandt for a long time. The band didn't really do that well. That's why Johnny's now the lead singer for Leonard Skinner. It's, it's, it's a steady job. But Eric is an unbelievable monster guitar player, um, but he's sort of in the heavy metal band. So these guys did not want to be seen as a southern rock band at all. This is a friend of mine, Jimmy Doherty. I played in the band with him. And uh, this is, um, uh, oh, I, her name slips my mind, but she was a backup, JoJo Bellings, a backup singer from Leonard Skinner, and that's Dorman Cogburn. They put a little trio together, and they got a bunch of the Skinner boys to play on their first album, which helped them get a deal. Sounds a lot like Skinner. That's Dorman on the guitar. Well, that's a Pastor Skinner song. Let me see if we can hear Jordan singing. He's a great singer. He was, he was Ronnie Van Zandt's favorite singer. I got to tell you this story. Dory told me that he was playing in, in a little bar band in Appleton, Wisconsin at a hotel. And Johnny, Ronnie Van Zandt called him up in like 1972 in the middle of the night and said, Jimmy. I, I want to uh, quit singing and I want to be the manager and, and producer of uh, Leonard Skinner. Now, how, how would you like to take my place as Skinner's lead singer? Wow. Yeah. Dory told me that. Dory said he, he just laughed in his face and hung up the phone. <laughs> uh. 
that's what a bad reputation Leonard Skinner had at that time for being a cruddy band. Doherty just laughed at him and hung up. Uh, Roster and Collins Band is after the crash. It's most of the guys from Skinner, except for the drummer on his pile. This is the Southside boy named Derek Hess, good friend of mine. Also another Southside boy, uh, uh, Barry Harwood. And the rest of them are from, from Skinner, except for Dale Krantz, who was a, who had been a backup singer for um, 38 Special. And I'm sure you remember. Big hit. So anyway, there was a sort of a love triangle between Gary and Dale and Alan and Gary and Dale quickly. They said they want to try to get away from all the crowd. Uh, this is a, a group that formed after Gary and Dale left, and now we have Jimmy Doherty again, uh, finally sort of taking Ronnie's place in a sense. And then all the rest of the guys were from the um, Ross and Collins band, except for Randall Hall, who's a real good friend of mine and lives in my neighborhood. And um, this band did almost nothing. They did one album and it stiffed. And the uh, guy who was the head of MCA, uh, Irving Azoff, just dropped them, said goodbye. We don't need no more little shredded stuff to MCA. So that was the end of, uh, end of the line for uh, Skinner and its remnants. I did play with Alan in a band in 84. That's me on the left, believe it or not. <laughs> and there's Alan, and uh, he can't get his guitar strap on, so I'm helping him put his guitar strap on. And then um, after he got the guitar strap on, we started playing, and there was a, a railing in front of the stage. And he leaned over, he was so messed up, he leaned over and fell over the railing <laughs> and landed on his face with his feet still up in the air and broke, broke the guitar at the headstock. And he was out cold like that. Nobody knew what to do. I was always taught when something happens in a bar band, you keep playing. <laughs> <laughs> because if you stop, you know, everybody's going to look around and see want to know what the problem is, but if you don't stop, a lot of people might miss it. <laughs> so I left it there like that. <laughs> and somebody, you know, I knew somebody would pick him up. <laughs> and here, here's me with Leon Wilkinson, and he was dating my first wife when I met her. <laughs> and I sort of stole her from him, but we, we stayed pretty close through the years. He died about 2000. And uh, Alan died, uh, I think, about 87. He was he, he was a maniac behind the wheel, and uh, he wasn't supposed to be driving, and he and his girlfriend got in an argument. And I'm speculating, he must have grabbed the wheel, and he ran him into a culvert, and they both flew out the same uh, the passenger window. And uh, she died, and he, he got paralyzed and uh, had to be in a wheelchair for the rest of his short life and uh, died from um, uh, pneumonia. Now here's here's a really bright spot here. This was the Derek Trucksman. I remember seeing him at the crowd pot when he was nine years old. And he's <laughs> sitting in with Ace Marlin's band. Little toehead, he was like, had white hair, and he's wearing an Ace Marlin t-shirt. He's sitting in with Ace Marlin's band. And the kid was a monster, even at 10 years old. Here he is now. <laughs> He's 40 something now. And uh, he is just so unbelievably good on the slide guitar. It's ridiculous. Well, his, his, his father is Butch Trucks' brother. So, Butch Trucks and the Allman Brothers Band is his uncle. So, he actually got into the Allman Brothers Band during the 90s when he was with them for 14, 15 years. Uh, and, uh, you know, finally, here's a group I don't think likes to be considered Southern Rock, but. You know, uh, what can you, uh, I can't define Southern Rock. I think they're a Southern Rock band, but they came along much later. Uh, J.J. Gray and Mofro. Uh, his real name is John Higginbottom. I did his first set of demos at my studio at Jacksonville Beach when he was with a group called Exit. And here, here's a recent photo of him. He, he's got to be a, not a big star, but he's got a good, strong cult following. And uh, he mostly sells records, you know, 
on the road with his band. They do a lot of dates. They're constantly touring. And that's a rough life, man. That is a rough way to make a living, touring 200, 300 days a year. See if I got something by that. So it's kind of a funky type song. And you know what? That, um, uh, Derek Trucks' is music, it, I don't know if you call it Southern Rock. It's very much R&B, you know. Uh, so and both of these guys are very much on the R&B side. Of, uh, of a Southern Rock. I don't know. Would you call it Southern Rock? I don't know. You don't know. You know what? It, 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 it's Southern Rock. If, 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 if you're in a band and you say it's Southern Rock, then it's Southern Rock. I say it's Southern Rock, it's Southern Rock. It sounds to me like the Doobie Brothers uh, when they did uh, Old Black Water. I would say that I would call Doobie Brothers a Southern Rock band, even though they were from San Jose, California. <laughs> Most of your bands in the early 70s sound like that. Oh, and here was a duo, a short lived duo named Van Zandt. It's, it's Johnny on the left and Donnie on the right. It's a duo. They got a deal with Columbia as a country act, and they had a top five country record in, in about 10 years ago. Which, well, granddaddy was a huge like a scholar blue collar of a man. But is there any difference he between country and southern rock nowadays? Country is about 90% of what I call Southern Rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Americana is a good term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
They, they were formed in Los Angeles. They did not go through Jacksonville. No, they didn't even go through the South. In fact, uh, uh, the guitar player, what's his name? I forgot his name. Yeah, no, no, the, the, the leader. Lowell George. Lowell George had been in the Mother's Invention. That's pretty far from the Yeah. We were playing golf uh, in uh, the home assassin area, and we stumbled into this restaurant called Neon Neon. Ico Steakhouse, and they claimed it was Leon from Wilson. Yeah. Do, do you have, know anything about that? I've heard that, but I, I could I could speak to that. Yeah. I think I have this right, but I think in the last week there was a story in the paper that Dolly Parton had been nominated to be in the Rock Hall Music Hall of Fame, but she declined for yeah. an honor because she didn't think she deserved it. Given, given what you're saying about the crossover between rock and country, what was that all about? Well, you know, rock, rock and the original rock and roll, if you're talking about the Elvis Presley, Carl Perkins stuff, that was about 50% country and 50% blues mm -hmm. is what it was. So, so, and Elvis was considered a country artist at first until he went over to RCA. Uh, rock and roll is, I mean, excuse me, Country music is a big part of the early rock and roll, but is is Dolly Parton a rock and roll artist? Uh, I wouldn't say so, would you? But see, that's another term that's just completely meaningless. The Supremes are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, how are the Supremes a rock and roll group? You know, so the term rock and roll got so bastardized that it just means youth music, right? right. Music for teenagers. Well, now it means music for old people like oh. us. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it meant youth. It meant music it meant for baby boomers. Yes. <laughs> <Hey, laughs> <Hey, Bowler. laughs> no, it's true. It's our uh, it's music. Yes. Yes. So it, it, it really means. I mean, what? It could be anything. It could be Tiny Tim. Is that rock and roll? <laughs> yes. Back in the, the 60s, it sounds like that there was a, uh, a, 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 a coming together of people playing guitar in a certain way that it comes out of rock. Was there anybody actually teaching guitar or music in Jacksonville at that time that maybe had influenced all these people? It's really funny you should mention that. I've been trying to, to dig around with all the older players that I know. Was there a big kahuna? in Jacksonville, like a Dick Dale, you know? Was there some big guitar hero in Jacksonville? And I don't think there was. It, the closest you could come would be Dickie Betts. And he didn't get here till 68, and he was only in town for one year. I've asked Walter Eaton this, and I said, well, they all, their heroes were the Ventures. But there was no local guy who turned everybody that I can find, and I've been obsessed with trying. I would think there had to be a Dick Dale type figure, and if any of y'all hear about one, you know I appreciate it. the heads up. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got it on my website, so if you want to email, feel free. But as far as I know, there was not such a person. Yes. Are there any women that could qualify as Southern Rockers? Because I saw yeah, two of them were in the group. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, that's a, a sore, sore subject. Uh, there was Dale Krantz, who sang lead. There was Bonnie Bramlett from Delaney and Bonnie. There was, uh, you know, I think Janis Joplin was a Southern Rocker. Oh, yeah. Joey, yeah, from Texas. Yeah, yeah, but she's sort of more country, I think, wasn't she? The girl from Wolverton Mountain. Yeah, they're few and far between, okay? It's like hands. There's no group, it's all women. Oh, no. Not that I know. In fact, I'd be, I, I'd be surprised if you put together a list of five women. Southern Rock is a boys' club. There's yeah. no question about it. Yeah. A white boys' club. Well, they had one black guy, <laughs> J Mo. And well, Willie had a black drum, but okay, two. Uh, I actually have counted all the members of all the Southern Rock bands, and there were eight black people out of a hundred or more musicians. So it's not that they weren't welcome, 
really, it's just that, you know, black people didn't want to play this. Black musicians weren't interested. Well, they couldn't tour with the band Taylor and Company. Well, they did. Yeah. 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 But, you know, black people just were not interested in this kind of music. But the music came from black music. Yeah, but here's... And so, it, you know, it, you're saying things that, it, you know, it, it, it's a little bit... No, here's, here's the thing. They didn't want to. We don't know whether they wanted to or not. They, they might have. They weren't attracted to it. And, and I can say this, too, with a lot of confidence, because I worked at a record store downtown, and uh, the clientele was mostly black, and most of our black customers at the store were only interested in what was up to date, and they did not like blues. Because blues was old, and it was back of the bus. That's your experience. I have been That's what I was told by my black customers. Then they, yeah. they wanted the, the they, Jimi Hendrix didn't even have a black clientele because he was playing old blues stuff. And black people, most of the black people, my black customers at the time, thought that was antiquated and cornball. That's your experience. That's my experience. That's what you're paying me for. <laughs> <laughs> Question, any other questions? What did the black people want at that point? They, they wanted danceable stuff. Uh, like James Brown. Boogie. Yeah. Boogie's, yeah. you know, dance music. Which is a Motown. continuum from, you know, I mean, it's just a continuum. So, you know, you, you go. And, I mean, when you think of... Uh, the dance programs that came out on TV. You've got, a, you know, uh, Baltimore, which had, you know, incredible dance going on with blacks and whites together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, it, it, it's just all an amazing amalgam. I know, but what I'm saying is this blue stuff was old hat to the, the average black man. Okay. It is up. Mark, you even go to a house. blue show today, and you see very few blacks at, at blue shows. I know all your blues players oh, are all yeah, white, for right. God's sake. Well, no, well, I'm saying even if you go over into the Delta to, mm -hmm. to most of the festivals, yeah. I bet you 90% of the audience is white. Is white. You're right. You're right. It's, uh, it, it's mm -hmm. not. But then uh, the black culture they, they have they, started with the black they culture. Shed, they've well, shed it. They've yes. shed that. That's, yes, I agree. That's so, in the unpleasant past, is what I've been told. Yes. By my black yep. customers. Yep. They don't want anything to do with it. Uh huh. For the most part. Any, any other questions? Okay, it was great. Thank you. Yeah, cash only. Twenty bucks. Twenty dollar bill. <laughs> and we hope to see you all at the exhibit opening next Friday. <laughs> you got a pen or a marker? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I should have mentioned. By the way, the book won a Florida Book Award. <laughs>